Abhishek, how did you like a CRS and Lucas? Pretty good. It was fun. That's really good. Really, really good. This uh, kidney cancer meeting seemed to proliferate, right? Like maybe now for a year. <laughs> yeah, no. well, actually, it's spaced out a little bit this year. So we have a little bit breathing room between them. Although the ACR and the KCRS kind of came on top of each other this year. <laughs> Hey, Jim, I think we could probably start. There might be okay. other people that roll in. Uh, sounds good. So, um, um, so I'm going to tell you guys a couple of stories where we'll see if we have time to get through both of them. Um, feel free to let me know if 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 uh, if you want me to go slower or or fast. This is for you guys. So, uh, and I think I mean, one of the things that I'm going to try to do, since this is the academy audience and uh, you all have uh, lab research programs, is to sort of illustrate a little bit of how I started my research program. And what I hope uh, is focusing on important questions and then trying to address them rigorously. Okay. So, um, so. Uh, so I titled this kidney cancer bench to bedside and back. Um, and all right, so let's see if this is uh, here we go. These are my disclosures. There are a couple that are relevant with Peloton Therapeutics and then some intellectual property around HIF. So uh, we all know of adrenal cell carcinoma, uh, you know, nearly half a million cases worldwide. Um, predominantly affects male, 75% on clear cell, and 30% of the patients present with regional or distant metastasis. Uh, you're also familiar with the sites of metastasis. They typically involve the lungs, uh, then less frequently bone and liver. Uh, in bone, the metastasis can erode the bone, causing fractures. Um, brain metastases are probably underestimated, could even be higher than 20%. And interestingly, kidney cancer also goes to the pancreas, which is an uncommon site of metastasis. You can see a metastasis here in the pancreas, but it's been known for some time that when kidney cancer goes to the pancreas, it is associated with improved survival. So when I started my lab, uh, we were interested in precision medicine approaches. So this was back in 2006. Uh, as Brian remembers, uh, in 2006, uh, we had very little to offer patients with kidney cancer. In fact, the reason I had, I had decided to focus on kidney cancer during my fellowship at the Farber starting in 2001 is because this is a tumor type that is resistant to chemotherapy and conventional doses of radiation, and IL-2 was the only option for patients. And, and that's a treatment that only a subset of patients are eligible for because it's very toxic. So we wanted to and develop better approaches to patients with kidney cancer. We thought that where we needed to start was understanding the genetics, figuring out how mutations affect cellular signaling pathways, using that knowledge for the identification of drugs, developing animal models where these drugs could be tested. And of course, if we wanted to apply this to a clinic, we would need biomarkers in clinical trials. So this was sort of the, the, the you know, this is available in our website and it's been there since 2006. And over the course of the years, we've made progress in the different areas and you can see a partial list of publications. If you want a more complete list of publications, you can go to the website. So um, despite advances that you're all familiar with, in particular with immunotherapy, kidney cancer remains largely incurable. Um, and you are familiar with data from, from the Checkmate 214 trial, where we are seeing perhaps 30% of the patients that are progression free at five years. And um, these are patients that might be cured, uh, although we use that word cautiously, but still the majority of patients uh, with their disease records and, 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 and remain uncured. So for me, this journey started with, uh, with targeted therapies. So this is an editorial I had the privilege to write that accompanied the publication in the New England Journal of Medicine of the first couple of studies, one with sunitinib, and I think later on uh, Tempsir almost, but that was available to me, uh, which illustrates the targeted therapies uh, that we have available for renal cell carcinoma here on the left-hand side, and here on the right-hand side, uh, the original therapy approved, interleukin-2, and then the immune checkpoint inhibitors. This is familiar to all of you. 
So how are we going to advance the field um, by through new targets and then new pathways? And I see David in the audience. David, this talk is going to focus primarily on targeted therapies, not immunotherapies. Uh, so we're looking at uh, cell autonomous processes. Uh, and of course, uh, you're all familiar about the importance of HIF downstream of BHL in, in mediating angiogenesis, which was which provided the rationale for the development of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors and, and bevacizumab. And uh, this led to the to the, I mean, the understanding of HIV regulation by hypoxia and BHL led to the Nobel Prize to Bill Kellen, Peter Radcliffe, and, and Greg, Greg Simmons in 2019. Um, there are several HIF isoforms, in fact, three of them, and we think that the most important one is HIF 2 alpha in mediating kidney cancer. And HIF 2 alpha not only regulates angiogenesis, but promotes cell proliferation, pluripotency, and would block apoptosis. So a HIF 2 inhibitor would have would be expected to have broader activity than, than inhibitors of angiogenesis as they are approved today. The HIF 2 alpha gene was discovered by Steve McKnight, who you can see here, who is the chair of biochemistry, and David Russell, who is the former dean of UT Southwestern, uh, who published this paper in Genes and Development, where they call HIF2 alpha EPAS1. This was based on a homology, a homology search. Uh, and there were three other manuscripts that came up shortly thereafter with, uh, with other groups reporting the same finding of uh, the HIF2 alpha gene. These, these followed the previous discovery of HIV one alpha by Greg Semenza. Uh, the structural studies also at UT Southwestern, uh, in this case by Kevin Garner, identified uh, or characterized the pass B domain of, uh, of HIV 2 alpha. So the HIV 2 transcription factor is made up of an alpha subunit and a beta subunit, which is also called ARNT. The beta subunit is shared with HIF with HIF one alpha, and uh, the transcription factor needs to dimerize in order to be able to bind DNA. And Kevin Garner did a structural study of the pass B domain of HIF two alpha, which is implicated in dimerization, and uh, this led to the finding of a very unusual cavity. Uh, you can see it filled with water molecules uh, here. Uh, in this model from an X, uh, X-ray crystallography. Um, and uh, Kevin Garner um, performed NMR-based fragment screening and identified small molecules that could bind uh, the cavity and provide a proof of concept that these small molecules, which would engage the cavity and induce an allosteric change, were able to dissociate uh, the, the dimer initially of purified pass B domains and subsequently purified proteins in keeping with the idea that this would antagonize HIF-12 function. So this led to a high throughput screen uh, leveraging the facility, which started with our library of 200,000 compounds. Uh, and, and you can see here, it went through a primary, and, uh, primary screen and a counter screen and a chemistry review and then uh, cell-based assays and some uh, chemistry optimization. Uh, eventually leading to a lead molecule, which was uh, with a potency of 17 nanomolar. Um, and, uh, and this was uh, reported here in this paper in Nature Chemical Biology and led to the founding of Peloton Therapeutics by Steve McKnight, uh, who was, uh, again, the, the co-discoverer of HIV 2 alpha uh, and chair of biochemistry. Um, so in summary, so I've shown you that this is a dimer, uh, was discovered at UT Southwestern. The structure was all by UT Southwestern. We did a screen which found these compounds. We founded a, uh, a biotech company in our biocenter, and this company developed these HIF2 inhibitors. And there are three HIF2 inhibitors that I'm going to be referring to throughout this presentation. PT2385, this is the first in class that was evaluated in the clinic. PT2399, which is a tool compound that we use in preclinical studies, and then PT2977 or belsutifan, which is the compound that was approved by the FDA in August of 2021. As you can see, structurally, these, these are all very similar. So for practical purposes, uh, we're going to be referring the, to these as HIF2 inhibitors or PT drugs. Belsutifan has better pharmacokinetics, compared to PT2385 and a slightly better affinity for the target. So now we have this HIF2 inhibitor and, and, and we're asking, does this HIF2 inhibitor have activity against kidney cancer? 
to, to address this question, we leverage our tumor graph platform. Uh, and these are models that we have generated where we implant tumor samples from patients into the kidney of mice. And the expectation would be that treatment with these PT drugs uh, would lead to uh, engaging of this cavity in the PASB domain, an allosteric change in the conformation of PASB of HIV-2 alpha, which leads to the dissociation of HIV-1 beta in an inhibition of the HIV-2 gene expression program. And um, um, Bill Kelling and I published these companion papers uh, in Nature already a few years ago, where we explored the ability of this HIV-2 inhibitor uh, in our case, in our PDX platform, in the case of building cell lines. So over the course of uh, over a decade, we've been taking tumors from patients and implanting them into mice. And of course, the first questions we asked were, uh, do these tumors reproduce the histological appearance, the gene expression, the mutations, the net copy number alterations, and treatment responsiveness? And we found that the answer to all of these questions was yes. So we validated the model, right? Anytime one works with a model, the first thing one needs to do is to validate the model. And with treatment responsiveness, importantly, we were matching the, the regimens given to the patients with pharmacokinetic data in humans so that uh, the, the circulating levels of the drug would be similar to what we find in humans. And we incorporated negative controls such as serlotinib, which is uh, known not to work for clear cell renal cell carcinoma and was, uh, did not have activity against clear cell renal cell carcinoma in the PDXs. So uh, in this uh, manuscript, uh, Roy uh, Elias, a former fellow in the lab, now at Johns Hopkins, uh, reported in 2021 uh, an update of this platform. And at that point, we had 926 patients whose tumors had been implanted into mice, overall 12, over 1,200 samples, uh, most of them from primary tumors, um, however, 168 from metastasis, tumors going to the kidney of mice, and then uh, they get passage into subsequent cohort of mice. Uh, we call them stable tumor graphs once they have been, they have grown in a second cohort of mice. And the tumors get preserved viable in the MSO, where we also preserve tumor samples from the patients. So we have a, a collection of over a thousand uh, renal cell carcinoma samples from patients preserved in the MSO, along with the stromal cells and TILs and whatnot, fresh frozen and FFP. And we've used these models to understand molecular mechanisms of disease for biomarker development, for the development of novel radiotracers, as well as for drug testing and discovery. And these models represent the diversity of our practice, which involves not only a university hospital, but also a county hospital. So as you can see, uh, we have, uh, you know, not in substantial percentage of black uh, Asian, and I think this is uh, American Indian uh, population, and uh, also a non-insignificant uh, number of Hispanics. So I'm just going to show you one piece of data for the validation of these results. So, so what you can see in this plot are unsupervised analysis of gene expression, where we are taking um, patient samples in black and then tumor graph samples in blue or red. If the tumor graph sample pairs with the corresponding patient is in blue, and if it doesn't pair with the corresponding patient is in red. And as you go or as you look around, you'll see that the vast majority of tumor graph samples, and this is regardless of passage. So for example, uh, I mean, you have this here, you can see uh, some tumor, some cohorts, uh, cohort zero, cohort one, these are early cohorts, uh, but we also have uh, some larger uh, cohorts, uh, although maybe not in this plot. Yeah, you can here, have here a cohort five or a cohort 13. Uh, for example, these are two more samples that have been passage in mice for 13 cohorts. So bottom line is that the majority of tumors in the mice cluster with a corresponding patient, which shows that they preserve the unique gene expression signature. And, right, So they are more similar to the particular patient than any two tumors from two different patients. So we deployed this platform to evaluate the HIV-2 inhibitor, and you can see the data here. So this is a tumor graph line, in fact, from a patient of mine. Uh, here you see uh, exponential growth with a vehicle, uh, sunetinib uh, significantly dampers tumor growth. And in the case of the HIV-2 inhibitor, we see, in fact, some regression. Uh, so this is illustrated here. 
uh, and this suggests that the HIFT inhibitor may be in fact more active than, 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 than sunitinib, at least for this particular patient. So we did a pharma level uh, uh, study involving 22 uh, independently derived tumor graph lines including from 18 clear cell venous cell carcinomas, a total of 267 mites. For those of you who do mouse work, this is a ton of work. Okay, So these mice are all being implanted with tumors, they are all being treated, uh, and, and these treatments are daily treatments, including weekends. And as you can see, some of these treatments may be 20 days, but in other cases, up to 50 days, right? So it's a tremendous amount of work, but it's part of our commitment to do things rigorously. So we wanted to know whether this drug would or would not work for kidney cancer. And here you can see the subset of tumors that were sensitive. You can see that they include tumors as, such as this one or this one, which are resistant to sunitinib, but they were responsive to the HIF2 inhibitor. Others were responsive to both sunitinib and the HIF2 inhibitor. So about 50% of the clear cell venous cell carcinomas were sensitive. There were a subset where we saw statistically significant difference in growth, but it was not very prominent. We called those intermediate, and there were a number of tumors that were resistant. All of the non-clear cell tumors were either intermediate or resistant, which is not surprising because non-clear cell tumors don't have VHL mutations and would not be expected to have HIF activation. The data is summarized here, so the HIF2 inhibitor was more potent than sunitinib and also better tolerated. And sunitinib is being dosed in the mice to match exposures in humans. So this the loss of weight in the mice is not because we are giving them 10 times the dose in humans. Uh, in fact, the circulating levels are quite comparable. But we also see this in humans. Sunitinib causes diarrhea and loss of appetite, as those of you who see patients know quite well. So these augur very well for this drug. We saw greater activity than sunetanab, which then was the standard of care and better tolerability. We did further characterization of both the sensitive tumors here in green and the resistant tumors in red. Uh, we could show that there was decreased fluorothymidine incorporation. This is an indicator of cell proliferation in this FLT pad. We could also show decreased proliferation by KI67. And looking at the vascularity, we saw significant reduction in vascular surface, as determined here by the C31 endothelial staining. Biochemically, we, we found what we had expected. So we took the tumors and performed immunoprecipitation studies. So what this involves, so each of these columns represents a tumor taken from a mouse where we are immunoprecipitating HIV-1 beta, which, is, which, is, which binds HIV-2-alpha and HIV-1-alpha. And we are asking, does HIV-2-alpha come down with HIV-1-beta in these tumor lysis? You can see in the vehicle through the tumors, we can see HIV-2-alpha with HIV-1-beta, but in the HIV-2 inhibitor 3 tumors, you can see that HIV-2-alpha is no longer bound to HIV-1-beta, in keeping with the notion that the drug bound to HIV-2-alpha induced an allosteric change and led to the dissociation from HIV-1-beta. Now, if you look at HIV-1-alpha, you can see that HIV-1-alpha remains bound to HIV-1-beta, which is in keeping with the notion that this drug is a specific for HIV-2 complexes and does not inhibit HIV-1 complexes. Um, we perform RNA sequencing studies uh, in these tumor graft mice, uh, and we found uh, about 300 genes that were downregulated by the HIV-2 inhibitor. We are looking here at sensitive tumors, and they include canonical targets such as VEGF, cyclin D1, IGF-BP3, CXCR4, and others. When we asked what happens in the resistant tumors, in the resistant tumors, we found similar dissociation of HIV-2, but the levels of HIV-2 alpha were significantly lower. And when we look by gene expression analysis, we in fact found that no genes were altered. So the way we interpret these results is by um, uh, uh, concluding that resistant tumors have low levels of HIV-2 alpha and, um, and um, Treatment with the HIV2 inhibitor may inhibit the, the HIV2 program, but that's not very active. And it appears to not be altering anything else, because otherwise we would be seeing changes here in the resistant tumors where we are not seeing changes in gene expression, either down-regulated or up-regulated genes. 
So this data supported a phase one clinical trial, which was led by Kevin Corning, so my colleague here at UT Southwestern, uh, in, in which I also participate. And in fact, I think most of the patients in the trial were, were from my practice. Um, where this HIF2 inhibitor was shown to be safe uh, and the maximum tolerated dose was not reached. This is a conventional three plus three uh, phase one clinical trial dose escalation design and where uh, the drug was also shown to have some activity as illustrated in the Summers plot. So you can see here, these are the different cohorts starting at 100 milligrams twice daily, all the way to 1800 milligrams twice daily. And this is a whopping dose. You wouldn't want to be taking that much Tylenol uh, because you would get sick. Uh, and yet you can tolerate that uh, at least during the MTV window uh, in this phase one clinical trial. And uh, of course, patients that were treated at lower doses are less likely to have activity. But this study showed that in approximately 20% of the patients, uh, there was prolonged uh, uh, control of the disease. These are heavily pretreated patients, most of them with at least three prior lines of therapy. There was one complete response and six partial responses. So this provided evidence that this was active and, and this was effective. There were on-target toxicities which were expected, which included anemia due to EPO downregulation, as well as hypoxia in some cases, uh, likely related to the impact of HIF2 inhibitors on the carotid body, uh, possibly also on the lung as well. So we had a companion study where we performed a pretreatment and on-treatment biopsy in a subset of patients and that partner with us on this research project. And I feel very fortunate to be working with patients that understand our research mission. Several of the patients that, that participated in the study were patients of mine. Uh, and it's not trivial to, to, to undergo uh, on treatment and, and post-progression biopsies. So in this case, we're comparing, uh, we're doing a, a proximity ligation assay where you see a dot, that means there is a HIF2 complex of HIF2 alpha and HIF1 beta. And you can see following treatment with, uh, with PT2385, there are fewer dots per nuclei in keeping with the idea that the inhibitor is dissociating the complex. And we can see this for two different patients. This is quantitated here, and this is associated with decreased HIV2 gene expression. Now, the thought uh, came to us, well, we have a drug that is very specific for HIV2. And I mentioned to you, and I'll show you some data, that HIV-12 levels differ between the sensitive and the resistant tumors. Sensitive tumors have significantly higher levels of HIV-12. So could we turn this, this inhibitor into a radio tracer, into a theranostic? And what that involved was substituting one of the endogenous fluor atoms for F-18. Uh, and of course, this requires developing a synthetic route uh, for this F18 level PT2385, where we have a phenomenal radiochemistry uh, a core uh, director, Shen Kai San, who managed to do that. Did, Jim, uh, can I ask you a question? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, historically we were always assigning uh, uh, VHL mutations to be whatever, type 1s or 2A, 2B2, depending on the spectrum of yeah. their ability to target, uh, well, disease associated spectrum, but also. I think in Bill's lab, we would always think of the extent to which they would target their substrates as well, right? So uh, to some degree, the 2C mutants, for example, wiped the HIFs clean, but we didn't know what exactly they were doing uh, in, in, in a E3 ligase context. You're seeing these tumors have high or low HIF to alpha. Uh, can you associate that with a particular uh, VHL mutation spectrum? Yeah, excellent What in question. your mind is biochemically right. happening here? Yeah. So that's a that's something we are investing. We don't understand the mechanism, and no, cannot be associated with VHL status. Uh, but uh, the data is shown here. So you can see here in green the sensitive tumors. This is HIF2 alpha, and we validated the antibody extensively. I encourage you all to be very skeptic of immunohistochemistry studies unless there is validation, because they are typically garbage. But I can tell you this is HIF2 alpha. You can see the crisp nuclear staining, uh, low HIF1 alpha in these sensitive tumors in contrast in the resistant tumors. Uh, Abhishek, we see low HIF2 alpha, but we see indeed higher levels of HIF1 alpha. Uh, 
uh, this is not only at the protein, but also at the, at the mRNA level. I don't have the data here. And this is quantitated here by Western blood. And there is one sample here that, as you can see, is underloaded. And uh, you can see some of the resistant samples do have some levels of, uh, of HIF to alpha. You can see these jealous miles a bit, so we would expect this to be here. But overall, very low levels of HIF to alpha in the, in the resistant tumors. So this set the foundation for for the for the evaluation of uh, of uh, PT two three eight five as a pet tracer. We use our PDX models to do that. So this is a PDX model that has been implanted with a low HIF two alpha tumor. As you can see, this is background staining. This is not nuclear staining. In a high HIF two alpha tumor, there is some background staining, but you can see the crisp nuclear staining. And as you can see with a pet tracer, we can see very high signal. Uh, in the tumor that expresses HIF-12 and very low signal in the tumor that lacks HIF-12. We are looking at the same mice, so this data is pretty convincing. The kinetics are quite fast. And this set the foundation for an IND submission and approval by the FDA in a clinical trial that is ongoing, uh, where uh, Jenny Ching, a um, new faculty member uh, from Mount Sinai, uh, is working with me. All right. So going back to the to the to the clinical trial and, and the parent drug, uh, as you know, uh, following this phase one trial, PT two three eight five was evaluated in a phase two trial, and then PT two nine seven seven was developed and evaluated in patients with Hippolyne Dow, and that eventually led uh, to 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 this study reported in the New England Journal of Medicine with uh, with Belsutifan. The company was acquired by Merck, which renamed. Uh, PT2399, uh, actually PT2977 Belsutifan. It's a study with 61 patients, single arm trial. Um, and as you can see here, uh, remarkable activity of Belsutifan uh, across uh, nearly all of the patients um, uh, enrolled in the study. Here we are focusing specifically on kidney target lesions. This data, which I updated, uh, for a presentation um, uh, at ESMO in 2022, to me is striking. So each row represents a patient in the swimmer's plot, and each dot is a surgery. And if you focus, for example, on the first patient, this is a patient that had three surgeries for CNS hemangioblastomas over the course of four years. Now, just imagine what that can do to, to someone's life three craniotomies for a CNS, or three likely craniotomies for a CNS hemangioblastoma. The patient starts with Sudifan, no further surgeries. So the number of surgeries that VHL patients require has been reduced very significantly, maybe, maybe by as much as 90 plus percent. So this is a highly effective treatment for these patients for whom there was nothing. This is a patient of mine with a couple of um, brain hemangioblastomas. Uh, as you can see, after four months of therapy with a partial response, uh, and as I mentioned, the, 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 the drug was acquired by Merck and is being marketed now as Belsutifan and is being evaluated uh, in uh, sporadic kidney cancer alone in a combination. And hopefully uh, the, the top study of comparing Belsutifan versus Everlomus in uh, previously treated patients with advanced RCC will be reported at ESMO this year. Now, does resistance develop? And we know that resistance is a problem with targeted therapies, and indeed resistance does develop uh, in patients. And that's uh, shown here. This is a patient of mine uh, was pre-treated with five or six lines of therapy, I forget, uh, and uh, remained on treatment for over a year with largely disease controlled by resist. But as you can see, if you are following the imaging studies, this uh, lesion in the kidney, which is not a second primary, but a metastasis, is progressively filling up over time. So even though this does not qualify as resist progression, it's clearly progressing. So I asked my patient whether he would be willing to, to let us biopsy uh, this progressive renal lesion, and he agreed to it. And, uh, and this is shown magnified here compared to that. And uh, interestingly, we found the mutation in HIF2 alpha. You can see it here in the green bars by next generation sequencing, or you can see here the peak in this bidirectional Sanger sequencing plot. This is a mutation that changes a glycine for a glutamate uh, residue. The mutation was not present in a pretreatment sample. 
and the mutation resulted in persistent HIV2 complexes uh, despite PT2385 uh, treatment and while the patient was on treatment and uh, led to reactivation of the HIV2 gene expression program in the patient's tumor. Now, interestingly enough, we had predicted that resistance would develop in our publication in Nature, uh, which preceded the, the clinical publication by a few years, where we had treated tumor grafts with a HIV2 inhibitor for over six months until resistance developed. And we showed that following the acquisition of resistance, the HIV2 complexes should be formed. And we had identified the same resistant mutation that we subsequently found in patients, as well as a second mutation in the HIV1 beta protein, which is at the interface between HIV1 beta and HIV2 alpha. This mutation, substitution of phenylalanine for a leucine residue, increases the affinity of HIV1 beta for HIV2 alpha, thereby reducing the ability of the HIV2 inhibitor to dissociate the complex. In vitro, we find that if we express these mutants uh, alone or in combination, the complex reforms. So the complex is no longer inhibitable by the HIV2 inhibitor but rather you, the complex reforms, and these two mutations appear to have additive effects. You can see there is a tremendous amount of HIV2 alpha bound to HIV1 beta when we have a HIV2 alpha G323E and HIV1 beta F466L uh, mutants being co-expressed. So uh, the development of resistance uh, led us to, to think about second generation inhibitors. And for the last uh, seven or eight years, we've been partnering with Arrowhead Therapeutics. Arrowhead is a company that develops siRNA based therapeutics, largely in the non-cancer space, uh, but they had developed an siRNA targeting HIV2 alpha, referred here as A1 HIV2 for the first generation siRNA, and then subsequently a second siRNA, we work with both in our preclinical models. These siRNAs have an, an RNAi trigger and then have a moiety that directs the uptake of the siRNA to kidney cancer cells. This is an RGD-like um, uh, moiety that binds alpha V beta 3, which is expressed in, our, in, in renal tumors, as is shown here in red, but not normal kidney cells. So we tested this siRNA in vitro against wild type HIV2 alpha and mutant HIV2 alpha, and we could show that the siRNA sequence, which is the same in the first and the second generation inhibitors, is able to deplete both wild type and mutant HIV2 alpha, and keeping with the notion that this could provide an effective uh, second generation inhibitor for patients that develop resistance mutations. So we tested uh, these uh, siRNAs in our tumor graph platform. We focus on HIV2 alpha dependent tumors. These are tumors that we knew um, responded to the HIV2 inhibitor. In some cases, very aggressive tumors. You can see this tumor with sarcomatoid features. In 21 days, look at the remarkable growth that we are seeing in these axial images uh, of the orthotopic tumor. And then when we treat with the siRNA, you can see that growth is significantly blunted. This is quantitated over here. The results are statistically significant. This is accompanied with significant decrease in HIV2 alpha protein by IHC and also by Western blood and abrogation of the expression of human VEGF. And of course, the only source of human VEGF in the tumor graph mice is the tumor graph themselves, uh, as you can see here. So this provides uh, evidence using the credential PDX platform that these siRNAs can be taken up by human tumors in mice, uh, and they can effectively deplete HIV2, and they can then regulate HIV2-dependent gene expression. We evaluated the siRNA in three different, in, in three additional tumor graph lines. So you can see there is inhibition in all three of them. These are, again, tumor graph lines that we knew are dependent for, uh, are dependent on HIV2, and uh, also express the integrin receptors. And as you can see, we are, we are seeing uh, uptake, we are seeing uh, inhibition of HIV2 uh, quantitated here by Western blood, and this is a specific for HIV2 and is not affecting HIV1 and is not affecting HIV1 target genes. So uh, we thought that we could use the HIV2 inhibitor and the siRNA to define the HIV2 transcriptome in kidney cancer. Uh, so I previously showed RNA sequencing data 
around mice that were treated with a PT drug and we did RNA sequencing for mice treated with this siRNA. And then we asked, what is the intersection? And frankly, I was blown away by this data. We found that 50% of the genes downregulated by the siRNA were also downregulated by the HIF2 inhibitor. Now consider that one, these RNA sequencing experiments were done several years apart. Two, the PDXs only partially overlap. Three, this RNA is given intravenously once a week or once every two weeks, I forget. Whereas the PT drug is given orally. Four, uh, this is looking at a single time point. Okay, And yet we found that 50% of the genes are common. Uh, now, something that is quite sobering, when we compare this data with data performing cell lines, this is data that has been deposited in GSE, similar type of experiment, instead of using an SI, using a guide RNA, comparing to the PT2399 drug, looking at genes that get downregulated, whereas in our much more complex platform, we found that 50% of the genes are downregulated in cell lines, 3% of the genes, I'm sorry, 50% of genes were in common, only 3% of the genes were in common. And more concerningly, when you look at the overlap, and I would argue that this is the transcriptome of HIF2 in kidney cancer, there is only one gene that overlaps. So this puts in question uh, the usefulness of, of uh, work in cell lines, at least with respect to the HIF2 pathway in understanding the HIF2 program. Now, with respect to the pathways that were uh, downregulated, uh, we found uh, E2F target genes, we found MIG target genes, uh, there was uh, a lot of uh, genes implicated in cell proliferation. Uh, you can see here the validation of uh, MIG target uh, gene signature one, uh, both with the PT drug and the siRNA, the E2F uh, target uh, gene signature, as well as G2M targets. Uh, and of course, uh, MIC has been previously implicated by Celeste Simon and others as a downstream effector of HIF2, and our data implicates for the first time E2F transcription factors as downstream effectors of, of, uh, of HIF2. Uh, we were surprised to find many genes implicated in the cell cycle, not just cycling D, which is a canonical target, and also in particular genes implicated in mitosis and cytokinetic, cytokinesis as being downregulated by the HIF2 inhibitor. And then we integrated uh, our signature of 147 genes with data has, that has been published by Peter Radcliffe and David Moll of putative direct targets in these chipsic experiments performing cells that are wild type or where uh, HIF1 alpha or HIF2 alpha has been knocked out. And we found that out of these 147 genes, 24 genes are potential HIF2 direct targets. I'm not going to go into the details, but this is validation experiments for three of them, SLC43A3, TMEM91, and this sync, this uh, sync, uh, uh, this uh, sync finger uh, transcription factor. As you can see, when you look at these chipsic uh, peaks, and they are uh, substantially depleted uh, in the HIF2 alpha knockout cells, which would be in keeping with direct regulation by HIF2, and they are largely unaffected in the HIF1 alpha knockout cells, which suggests that this HIF2 regulation is exclusive. So we've identified 24 genes that are likely to be direct HIF2 targets that are likely to implicate in clear cell venous cell carcinoma and development from among the 147 genes that we found. Uh, so this work uh, set the foundation for the evaluation of the siRNA in the clinic. Most of the work preclinically was done with the first generation siRNA although we also use the second generation, but the second gener generation is not as potent. So you can see here the level of knockdown of the first generation compared to the second generation. The second generation is less able to knock down HIF-12 than the first generation. Nonetheless, we did see knockdown and anti-tumor activity in our preclinical models. This was much uh, easier to manufacture, and this is the one that the company wanted to go forward with in the clinical trial. So I'm not going to go into many details uh, of the clinical trial. Um, we reported preliminary uh, results in ASCO uh, last year, 
and the paper is right now being with the final results. It's being uh, it's being uh, completed as we speak. I'm going to show you, as I did for PT2385, uh, this uh, swimmer's plot of time on therapy among the 26 patients in this dose escalation cohort. So you can see the cohort one with a lower dose, cohort two intermediate dose, and cohort three with a higher dose. There were two patients with a partial response and eight patients that at, at this early time point has a stable disease. So there was some activity, but not uh, as much activity as with a PT drug as we had seen before. Importantly, however, there was significant toxicity, including neurotoxicity, uh, which uh, has led to the rethinking about uh, further development of this agent. I'm going to show you a case study of a patient of mine. It's a patient of mine that enrolled in cohort two. It's a patient that had paraneoplastic polycythemia and therefore a HIF2 dependent tumor, very aggressive tumor. In fact, we had to repeat the scans during the two week washout period because there was overt progression, which you can see here in this subcarinal node, which has probably more than doubled in size in two weeks. The patient had two doses of the HIF2 siRNA marked here in red. Uh, and only two doses because she had a metastasis in her colon, which bled, which precipitated an acute coronary syndrome, and she came off a study. However, despite just two doses of the siRNA, we saw a partial response, which is quantitated here, uh, which was as stable for over the course of four months, despite no therapy, and profound suppression of her eposecretion. At about four to five months, hippo started going up, we started seeing progression on scans. The patient started on tibocineb, and we saw further reduction in EPO. Uh, the study involved a companion biopsy, and comparing the results of the biopsy at baseline to the biopsy at 16 days, we could see depletion of the nuclear HIF-2 alpha signal, and we generated a tumor graph line from the supraclavicular limb node that we biopsied in the patient, in which we did also a, a trial with the siRNA, where we could see HIF-12 depletion by immunohistochemistry or Western blood, and we could see substantial activity as we saw in patients. So, of course, um, uh, this, um, in a way, is, uh, uh, you know, um, um, science fiction I mean, the idea that one could use siRNA to treat patients with cancer. Uh, but I think, in my opinion, the study does provide a proof of concept for, for precisely that, effective delivery of siRNA to kidney tumors with effective uh, target depletion and anti-tumor activity. And one might think about now integrating the siRNA with a PET tracer that I mentioned, and one could imagine treating patients with siRNA and being able to look in real time at HIF-2 alpha depletion using the PT2385 PET. All right, uh, hopefully this was clear because I'm going to skip the conclusion so that I can get to the second part in the next 15 minutes or so. Uh, so I mentioned to you that in terms of approaching uh, kidney cancer, uh, the two avenues, one might be new targets, the other one is new pathways. So I'm going to delve now into the genetics of clear cell venous cell carcinoma. It's not just the VHL pathway, but it's also PAP1 and PBRM1 and other genes. So we've done a lot of work in this area. These are publications from the lab. Um, we initially discovered the mutations in PAP1 uh, in kidney cancer along with a group in China. Um, the PBRM1 mutations were discovered by, by a group in the UK, and we found uh, that there was differential association with tumor grade and outcomes. So this is the paper from Binte, Mike Stratton, and the Futiel describing PBRM1 mutations in kidney cancer, uh, which were found in about 50% of clear cell venous cell carcinomas. This is our paper. Now you'll notice that this paper doesn't simply say that BAB1 is mutated in kidney cancer, but in fact it says that BAB1 defines a new class of renal cell carcinoma. And we thought this was the case for several reasons. We found that BAB1 mutant tumors were associated with high grade. And uh, we found that BAB1 mutations tended to be tended to anti-correlate with PBR1 mutations, which we discovered were associated with low-grade tumors. So this is the data. So this is our cohort, uh, which we sequence for both BAB1 and PBR1. And you will see that when we look at double mutant tumors, they are underrepresented. This is highly statistically significant, indicating that you mutate one or the other, 
but you generally do not mutate both. And uh, we performed a meta-analysis, including a cohort from the Beijing Genome Institute, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and the TCGA. Suffice to say that the results were consistent with the results in our study in that double mutants tend to uh, be observed at a frequency lower than expected by chance alone. Uh, as you know, um, um, BAP1 and PBRM1 we found were on chromosome 3P next to BHL, uh, where CD2 is also located in an area that get lo gets lost in the majority of tumors, not only in the familial setting, but also the sporadic setting. And this led us to propose the following model, uh, which we published in JCR in 2014, uh, where loss of VHL uh, is followed by loss of PBRM1 or loss of BAP1. Um, and as I'm going to show you, this has implications for the tumor. Uh, following this data, this needs to be revised based on uh, Samra's work, as we think that the first event is the lesion of 3P, not necessarily mutation in VHL, but the model would be valid certainly for patients with uh, VHL syndrome, the majority of which have mutations in the VHL gene. So I alluded to the fact that we discovered that BAP1 is associated with high-grade tumors and PBRM1 was associated with low-grade tumors. And this is an advantage of working in a multidisciplinary setting because this had alluded uh, or eluded the, the, the group at the UK. Uh, we asked whether these changes in grade had implications uh, in terms of patient survival. And this is simply looking at the genomic cohort. And as you can see, those patients that had mutations in PBRM1 compared to those patients that had mutations in BAP1 had significantly better survival with a hazard ratio that approaches three. And when we look at the TCGA cohort, we found very similar results with a hazard ratio of 2.8. We develop an immunohistochemistry assay, which is predicated upon the notion that BAP1 is a tumor suppressor gene. So when you mutate it, in the majority of cases, you lose the protein. And we, we, we compare the performance of the immunohistochemistry to the sequencing uh, analysis. I'm not going to get into these results. Suffice to say that the results are comparable. Uh, and doing using this immunohistochemistry assay, we could then access uh, the cohort of, from the Mayo Clinic, which is a huge cohort of 1,300 patients with which which have been followed up, as you can see, for over two decades, and where we were able to validate that BAP1 loss was associated with uh, poor survival, in this case, looking at kidney cancer-specific survival. And uh, we also developed an immunohistochemistry assay for PBRM1, and I'm not going to have time to go over this, but these immunohistochemistry assays allow us to distinguish tumors that have heterogeneous mutations in BAP1 and PBRM1 in two different areas, from tumors that have simultaneous mutations in BAP1 and PBRM1 in the same tumor. And using this, uh, uh, we uh, characterized the Mayo cohort, and we found that um, kidney cancer-specific survival was quite different depending upon BAP1 and PBRM1 status. Patients with wild-type tumors had the best survival, following, followed by patients with PBRM1 mutant tumors, followed by patients with BAP1 mutant tumors, and then followed by patients with double mutant tumors. And in this larger cohort, we asked again what happens with the expected frequency and the observed observe frequency of these double mutant tumors. And we found that the double mutant tumors, once again, were underrepresented in keeping with this idea that these mutations anti-correlate in patients. So this led us to this upgraded model where PBRM1 loss results in low-grade tumors and BAP1 loss results in high-grade tumors. And this has implication for patient survival. We went forward to generate the first genetically engineered mass models of clear cell renal cell carcinoma, which had not been possible in the past because, as it turns out, our, our data shows that VHL mutation alone is not sufficient. You need to mutate VHL and BAP1 and VHL and PBRM1. So I'm going to show you that VHL and PBRM1 mutations in the mouse result in low-grade tumors, whereas VHL and BAP1 mutations in the mouse result in high-grade tumors, showing that, as we had previously discovered in patients, um, BBRM1 and BAP1 are not only markers, but indeed drivers of tumor grade. So this is an example of, of the PBRM1 mutant tumors uh, in the kidney. You can see multiple tumors. These tumors develop with a longer latency than the BAP1 deficient tumors, and they are indeed of lower grade. You can see these monomorphic clear cells, and the BAP1 mutant tumors tend to be much more aggressive, have high levels of K67, and the low-grade tumors tend to have higher levels of vascularity compared to the high-grade tumors where we see less CD31 staining. 
but of course, uh, low grade tumors, which we found were particularly angiogenic, um, are uh, also characteristic of tumors that metastasize to the pancreas. So uh, these uh, led us to hypothesize that maybe uh, the reason why tumors that metastasize to the pancreas associated with better survival is that these tumors are PBRM1 deficient. So we partnered with Brian and look at our cohort at UT Southwestern and Cleveland Clinic, and we found that, as previously shown, tumors that metastasize to the pancreas associated with better survival, and these tumors were generally PBRM1 deficient and rarely BAP1 mutant. They tend to be very vascular, seldom infiltrated with CD80 cells, and looking retrospectively, these patients did a lot better with an angiogenesis inhibitor than with nivolumab. In fact, when we look at the progression-free survival of patients with pancreatic metastasis compared with, to patients without pancreatic metastasis, we could see that the reduced progression-free survival in the patients with pancreatic metastasis with nivolumab, uh, whereas there was improved progression-free survival with an angiogenesis inhibitor. Of course, low-grade tumors may become high-grade tumors. And the question is, how might low-grade tumors become high-grade tumors? And we have previously discovered that CD2 mutations actually cooperate with PBRM1. So I showed you that BAP1 and PBRM1 mutations tended to anti-correlate. And uh, in context, we found that PBRM1 and CD2 mutations were overrepresented in our cohort, suggesting cooperativity between these two tumor suppressor genes. And um, to ask whether CD2 worsens survival in a PBRM1 deficient background, we performed studies again with the Mayo Clinic. This was led by Tai Ho. And as you can see in PBRM1 deficient tumors, if you are also mutated for CD2, kidney cancer specific survival is significantly decreased. So this uh, suggests that one way PBRM1 deficient tumors may become more aggressive is through mutation of CD2. And I show you CD2 cooperates with PBRM1 loss. Might there be other ways? So we're going back to the mice. And one observation that we made in the mice is that PBRM1 deficient tumors tended to have low mTOR activity, whereas BAP1 deficient tumors tended to have high mTOR complex 1 activity. And we have previously discovered mutations in TSC1 in clear cell renal cell carcinoma. And TSC1, as you know, is a negative regulator of mTOR. So we wanted to ask whether disrupting one allele of TSC1 in PRM1 deficient tumors and activating mTOR would lead to an increased uh, grade, uh, increased tumor grade and aggressiveness. So here we are looking at tumors that arise in mice that are deficient for VHL, PRM1, and have loss of one copy of TSC1. And if you look by h &E, you can see here one, two, three tumors. But if you look closely, there is actually another tumor here that is a lot more subtle. Now, if we do an immunohistochemistry for a 6 phosphorylation, we find that these three tumors over here have high 6 phosphorylation. In fact, there is a fourth tumor over here, whereas this tumor over here has low 6 phosphorylation, and this coincides with loss of the TSC1 allele. So there is loss of uh, the second copy of TSC1 and activation of mTOR complex 1, and these tumors with mTOR complex 1 are associated with high grade, and these tumors with low mTOR complex 1 remain low grade. So these data suggest that one mechanism whereby these low-grade tumors become also higher-grade tumors is through inactivation of TSC1 and activation of the mTOR complex 1 pathway, as is shown in the mice. So we were delighted uh, to see uh, the experiments from Sanda Turajilic uh, that she published subsequently to our data that validated in this multi-region analysis uh, several of our results. So she found in tumors that then there was this uh, multiclonal driver with VHL loss and PAP1. She also found the PBRM1 uh, CD2 and also the PBRM1 PA3 kinase and TSC1 loss, uh, where we had previously seen cooperativity in the mice. So what about the BAP1 mutant tumors? So these are high-grade tumors, and I showed in the mice they look to be poorly vascularized, and they are inflamed. So here we leverage a different platform, a platform that I previously introduced to you, which are the PDX models. So in these PDX models, we can perform empiric analysis of the tumor microenvironment. These are empiric analysis because we can take the tumor from the patient and we can subtract RNA sequencing data in the tumor in the mice. And because the only thing that grows in the mouse are the tumor cells, you are left with 
the gene expression signature of the stroma in the patient. Uh, anyways, when we characterized the stroma in patient tumors, we found that there was an inflamed stroma and an uninflamed stroma. You can see here all of these markers of inflammation upregulated in these tumors that we defined as being inflamed, and you can see how decreased these markers are. In contrast, if you look at angiogenesis, you can see the inflamed tumors have very little angiogenesis, whereas the uninflamed tumors have prominent angiogenesis. This is like a switch. You either have an angiogenic tumor or you have an inflamed tumor. Interestingly enough, we found a highly statistically significant correlation between BAP1 loss and tumor inflammation, uh, which is shown here. And there was a correlation between PRM1 loss and angiogenesis and lack of inflammation, which did not reach a statistical significance. And uh, this led us to hypothesize that maybe inflammation was the tumor inflammation was the explanation for these enigmatic prognostic factors that we had been using. And to my knowledge, this is the first time that it was proposed that MSKCC or IMDC risk factors could be indicators of inflammation. And indeed, when we look at the inflamed tumors, we found that the, the, the patients were had higher levels of thrombocytosis and also had higher levels of anemia than patients that had uninflamed tumors. Um, and uh, this also correlated, as would be expected, with decreased survival. So putting it all together, it appears that a subset of tumors have BAP1 loss. BAP1 loss is associated with inflammation. Inflammation in the stroma extends beyond the tumor uh, with some systemic manifestations that include thrombocytosis and anemia, and is associated with poor survival. All right, uh, I'm three minutes short of the hour. Um, I'm going to hope I gave a clear presentation and that the conclusions are apparent uh, because I want to go to the acknowledgments and open it up for questions. Um, and if anybody wants, I'm happy to go back to the conclusions. So I talked Thanks. to you about, about a lot of stories. I've highlighted here uh, some people. So Jenny Chin uh, is helping with uh, with a PET, the PT2385 PET. Vanina is our tumor graph platform. Wen Fang Chen was the lead postdoc on the preclinical studies with the HIV2 inhibitor, and Roy put together our tumor graph uh, platform in the cell reports paper. Yifeng Gu uh, was the postdoc that led the, the GEM studies in the mice. Uh, Eric uh, did the, the studies with the siRNA uh, drug that we published. Uh, Samuel um, was the postdoc uh, that reported on the discovery of BAP1. Uh, Nermish was the lead author on the pancreatic story. Uh, Shan Shan Wang reported the first gem models of, uh, of BAP1. Uh, obviously, we work very closely with uh, our colleagues in the kidney cancer program. I already mentioned Kevin Corney, which led the phase one trial. Uh, we work very closely also with, with Payal Kapoor, who is a fabulous pathologist and an integral component of our team. Shan Kai Shan is the director of the, uh, of the cyclotron. Uh, Tao Wang did the bioinformatic analysis in, in the, that leading to the identification of the inflamed stroma uh, in Mayo, Mayo Clinic. I already mentioned we use their cohort quite extensively. Brian has been a collaborator across a number of studies and I specifically mentioned the pancreatic study. Uh, we work very closely with the Peloton team and then the Arrowhead team, and these are the sources of funding. All right. Uh, so I hope uh, this was uh, informative uh, for you guys, and I'm happy to entertain questions if there are any. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. I can <clears throat> open it to the group for questions. I have to extra the drop off for a faculty interview, but uh, the meeting will keep going in the recording. Um, okay. So for questions, as long as anybody has, Lucas, why don't you start? Well, thank you, Jim. So uh, this was like a fantastic, informative talk. I have just a couple of questions. Uh, when you were showing your tumor graphs, uh, you can see that there was a lot of clustering that was related to the patient, to the tumor graph. But I'm just curious, what happened with the other tumors that are clustering together? What is the main driver of that type of clustering? Is that related to a specific molecular alterations? What, what is happening with those samples? Are you asking about um, clustering together across patient tumors? Yes, correct. Yes. And you, yeah. Well, yeah, thank you. So, um, so um, that's likely to be uh, informed by the genetics of the tumor. 
uh, and we have um, we previously showed that um, PAP1 and PBRM1 uh, deficient tumors are associated with characteristic gene expression signatures. Um, these signatures are not robust enough so that you can infer PAP1 and PBRM1 from the gene expression analysis alone. But um, both of these proteins are proteins that impact uh, chromatin um, and uh, impact gene expression. So the clustering that you see of patient tumors is likely driven by mutations. I should also point out that those clustering analyses are analysis specifically of the tumor and they do not include the stroma. So anytime we're doing studies of the PD axis and the human tumors, because the, the stroma comes uh, from the human in the human and comes from the mouse in the mouse, those analyses are simply reflective of gene expression of tumor cells. Yeah. Any other questions? And if there are uh, no questions, go ahead. Uh, uh, Jim, a couple of uh, uh, ideas. So one is uh, the whole mutual exclusivity with, with BAP1 and PBRM1. Uh, I mean, in, in almost all other contexts, we think of them, not, not those two proteins, but any anytime you have that type of mutual exclusivity, we think either of redundant functions or antagonistic functions in some instances, uh, if, if both events co-occur. So uh, has I'm trying to remember, has anybody done an experiment where you inactivate PBRM1 in a BAP1 deficient line or conversely, BAP1 in a PBRM1 deficient line? And, and, and can the... Can, uh, the cells tolerate that uh, ex vivo okay. or even in like in vivo growth. So uh, a very perceptive question, Abhishek. Based on what I have shown you, which of the two possibilities do you think is more likely that they are redundant or that they are somehow antagonistic? Well, I think I think in my mind, I think it would be more likely that there would be synthetic lethality between between the two. Right. Yeah. Right. Or some kind of synthetic interaction. Why? Because I've shown you that they are associated with different grade, different gene expression programs, and different outcomes, right? So that would suggest that they are not redundant. Uh, so to test this hypothesis, we have gone forward and have generated mice that are doubly deficient for BAP1 and PBRM1 to try to, to do this. This was a more difficult uh, experiment than it sounds because the two genes are linked in the mouse, which basically means that we had to take BAB1 flux mice and target PBRM1 locus with uh, variant LOX P sites. We also want to use variant because we want to make sure we are with grid recombinase, we are not removing intervening sequences. And what I can advance for you confidentially is that. Uh, Provocatively, we find that BAP1 and PRM1 cooperate in tumorigenesis. So VHL and BAP1 gave us tumors, VHL and PRM1 gave us tumors. VHL alone, PRM1 alone, and BAP1 alone don't give you tumors. BAP1 and PRM1 gives you tumors. So uh, these two genes, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you that we still don't know why uh, this is antagonistic, but uh, the mice suggest uh, that these two genes can cooperate, uh, which is keeping with the idea that they are not in redundant pathways. All right. Any other questions? And don't feel don't feel like you have to ask a question. If there are more questions, I'm happy to entertain them. If not, I'm sure we all have other stuff to do. All right. OK, so I'm going to close off. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon and uh, good luck to all of you in the Academy. Um, and I'll, we'll see you guys soon. Take care. Bye. Thank you very much.